This is certainly not the most turbulent time ever. There have, right. there have always been turbulent times. There's always been war. There's always been people treating each other badly and, and you know, un unsavory things going on in the world. But it does seem like now the matrix is coming on and asserting itself more just as more and more of us are sort of awakening and seeking to exit it. Here's more things to fear. Here's more things to divide you. He's doubling down on, okay, here comes some more. You better fear it now and you better get back in because, you know, the matrix wants to, to stick around. Welcome to the Stream of David podcast. I am here today with Taya Bootcamp enrollment coach, Brent Howe. And Taya Bootcamp graduate, I should add. How are you doing, Brent? Wonderful. Thank you, David. You've been on before, but it's been a couple of years, hasn't it? It's been at least a couple of years since we've talked. Yeah, we, on, we interact on a, a weekly, if not almost daily basis, but... <laughs> I haven't dragged you on in a while. But here you are. And it, you know, you have a lot of great insight because what what year did you graduate from boot camp? 2019. So 2019. So you've been practicing for a few years now and five, five years. It, it continues to unfold, but I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I want you mm -hmm. to kind of tell us about that. So let's dig into detuning, which is a huge part of the tire practice. Mm-hmm. All right. Very good. Um, you know, uh, David, the, the conversations that I have about boot camp um, really uh, are boot camp detuning the Taya path, the Taya process and so forth um, really do focus a lot because I am a boot camp enrollment guide and I'm having those conversations very regularly. And uh, that, that that's a lot of my perspective in communicating my thoughts about Taya. Um, what I would like to contribute uh, in our conversation today, uh, very simply, is uh, in 2019, uh, I was uh, 57 years old. Um, I chose a career in sales. Uh, <laughs> when I graduated in co from college with a degree that really couldn't take it to the bank. You had to find something to make it work. And I learned pretty quickly uh, that a, a sales uh, job, a sales position uh, for the right personality and energy is an, is an easy job to get. And I found out that I really enjoyed, I, I enjoy the opportunity in any position to bring value to someone. And throughout all of my positions over the years and the different companies and types of work I've performed, types of sales I've performed, um, the, the, the enjoyment that I receive is knowing that I am bringing value to somebody. So, um, but in 2019, uh, when you and I first spoke in, I think, March of that year, I had... Uh, discovered your podcast stream probably about three weeks previous uh, to me calling you. Um, I was looking for a new podcast the way a lot of folks do, and I and, and your face scrolled, you know, appeared on the little scroll, and it said the first word that I noticed was channeling, and I thought, oh, this is different. So I, I clicked on it and I listened to, uh, to, to were you into, were you into channeling part of that? Were you a Abraham or <sighs> Abraham? Well, all right. Under, understand this about me. Um, I have learned, uh, one, one point uh, you and I discussed in our pre call, uh, is how I am continuing to experience clarity coming to my mind. Um, even five years after learning the Taya process, but the Taya process for me now is a 24 hours a day mindset of applying the Taya tools. Uh, so I wasn't into channeling at that time, but David, what I was into and, and uh, what my mind reminded me was I remember going to bookstores. You remember back in about 1972, three, four, you were younger then. Uh, but you go to the malls, the malls are all brand new then. And everybody went to the malls. And, and one of my favorite places to go to were bookstores because I just loved to, to dig and learn. And I would walk into a bookstore and I would ask myself, what, what's the best thing I can find here? And my mind always told me 
Look for something that will help you learn to live your best life in this world that we're in. Because even at that time, I had a perspective that I'm a spirit or I'm a portion of consciousness. I'm a strand of consciousness. And I felt just a little bit uh, like a stranger and I've been dropped in this place. And it's like, okay, what are the rules for this place where we are? So um, that was an interesting perspective that my mind uh, bubbled up in clarity uh, not too long ago about, you remember when you always used to always search for the best way to live life. Just show me how to live life. Just show me the the rules of operation so that I can live my best life. Uh, so it obviously uh, uh, found Taya, and that's the best thing I've found so far. Wasn't into channeling at that time, but I was I was into I was into learning at that time. The stream is always saying that humans must have an operating system. It's not optional. We have to operate in an operating system, just like our computer doesn't function without one. We don't function without one either. Right. Um, you, you're defaulting into something. Even if you are mentally ill, living on the streets, drug addicted, not functioning in society, you're still operating in somewhat of a belief system. It's not necessarily fitting into the matrix very well, but you're still in a belief system. You just default into something no matter what. And so... Yeah. You know, the, the instruction book that I was introduced was the Christian Bible. Mm -hmm. This is okay. how you're supposed to live your life. Although the people that were introducing me to it weren't really following it very well. <laughs> okay. And I had I kind of took issue with that early on. Like, okay, you're telling me this mm -hmm. is what I'm supposed to be doing, but you're not doing this, but I'm supposed to do it. Okay. I, I got it. And the, and of course it's, it's a, it's a book written by multiple people over a very long period of time that contradicts itself continually. And it was just very confusing to me. And I just never got that God or source was, was that confusing that it needed to be okay. that confusing that we needed all these, you know, all this terror, <laughs> all this old Testament <clears throat> stuff that we needed all of that to, to behave. We didn't, we don't need mm -hmm. all of that to not harm each other. And Correct. maybe we did for a while, but we're mm -hmm. certainly moving out of that period now. And that belief system thing is what we all seek. And usually when we're in our late teens, early 20s, and we're starting to sort of walk away from the one that we were indoctrinated into as a kid, that's when we're kind of out in the wilderness and we're susceptible mm. to all kinds of things. And if you have your wits about you, you can sample things and say, does this feel right or does it not? And when you land on something that just feels right, I think it's the way to go, at least for a while. I agree, but man, David, how for you and for me, I know you were raised with downloads from the stream and I know that you, you kind of, you know, tried to push that down a little bit, but how often do people really find something that resonates just extremely energetically with them? Um, I really never encountered any other, let's say, belief system, thought process, mindset practice that rang my bell and answered questions that I had in my mind that were unspoken uh, more than Taya does. So, mm. you know, Taya, uh, I'm, I'm going to include some of my, my boot camp language here. Um, we've talked about that, the, that, you know, Thai is not for everybody necessarily, uh, the process, uh, the, the belief system, uh, and even, you know, uh, the, the path for applying it is really not for everybody. Uh, but so anyway, uh, it was right for me. Uh, but to answer your question, was I into channeling at that time, man, David, I was into learning. Uh, anything that I could find that, you know, any rocks that I could turn over that may have a, a nugget in there for me. Um, okay. There's Edgar Casey, And I, at that time I had no clue about reincarnation and consciousness and source and the Akashic records. All of that was just, you know, I had no clue, no idea. I didn't know where he was getting this stuff, but it was interesting. Um, getting it from somewhere. So, and then you've got Abraham and uh, Esther Hicks. Um, 
And I read a lot of, of Abraham for the value of the information to help me manifest abundance and, and some peace of mind. Okay. Um, and that's, that's where it went. And of course we, we know, uh, how, uh, Taya and Abraham compare and contrast. We talk about that a lot on here. Uh, it served its purpose extremely well. As a matter of fact, I, I know that uh, like you, that the Abraham teachings served you up to come to grips with your downloads and the stream for that. Right. So it, it set me up to say, all right, there is, I call it universal divine information from source. All right. Universal divine and uh, I was open to that at that point. And your um, your podcast at that time, you know, and I've I've said this before. I had questions in my mind my whole life about okay, why are we here? Why do we have to go through all this? And then uh, and then just other thought thought thoughts that I had that I couldn't complete the the whole thought. But then as you were speaking and sharing what the stream shared with you and had taught you. That was the other part of the thought. That was the rest of the sentence. I thought, that's it. You know, you were saying, you were saying thoughts and feelings that had been in my mind all my life and that I had also been searching for the completed thought all my life. So uh, obviously it resonates with me uh, for that. So, uh, but at that time when I, when I ran across you, um, I was really struggling uh, I, I really can't, uh, emphasize how much I was struggling because, um, having a career in sales, 50% success, 50% failure, probably, you know, if I'm being fair, maybe a little bit more failure than success, because as time went by, you know, I had underlying depression that, that appeared in me about the time I was 13 or 14 years old, just going into puberty and junior high school. Uh, when you feel like everybody's looking at you and you're just so uncomfortable, uh, all the time and, and you don't know why and it's hormones and all that stuff. So, um, depression took hold at that time. So years go by, decades go by failures in my desire to be successful, uh, with certain jobs, with certain companies in certain roles. And I allowed those failures to stick to me, to take up root in my mind and in my memory and in my feelings and in my heart and, and really allowed them to define me. So, um, I was, I had really developed a number, quite a, a large number of what I call habitual thoughts. They were feelings and thoughts, not voices. Could, I, could, I could describe it as that. Uh, but they were habitual thoughts that fired all the time about you're going to fail. This isn't going to give you what you want. And, you know, and I'm, and I'm grinding it out because if you're in sales, you know, David, because you have sales in your background, 98, 99% of prospecting and some sales is 98% no, or right. not yet. Not yet. Yeah, it's funny when you said a uh, you know, sales job was easy to get. I thought, yeah, it's easy to get, but it's not easy to keep and even more difficult to actually earn a living in. But if you, if you can, it can be very rewarding and a lot of fun. Uh, but you're right. Sales is saying it. People are terrified of sales. Uh, absolutely terrified sometimes of getting into sales. But then people that love it, love it and, and, and love doing it. And it does offer an opportunity for people that don't necessarily have a, a formal education uh, to earn a nice living. And that's that Correct. was the path I took. Correct. Exactly. Um, right. There are the financial and monetary rewards that can be generated if if it's a good situation for you, if it's a good fit. Um, and <laughs> I didn't have a whole lot of experience really with, with uh, that part of it, which fueled desire in me to keep pushing and pursuing and go after it. And it's, of course, you know, it, it's still in me. Um, 
I, I honestly believe that, uh, you know, let's, let's talk about reincarnation and, and contracts and all that sort of thing. I honestly believe that it was part of my script lines of coming to this earth of you're going to pursue abundance, financial abundance. Maybe in a prior, prior life, I wasn't very good at it. Well, you're going to learn how to do it this time. I'm learning how to do it now. Okay. I'm there. I'm on that path. I'm learning how to do it. Uh, but five years ago, uh, I was, I was in a bad place. And you know, David, if we look at the vibrational spiral, I was, I was several notches below neutral. What am I going to attract? Garbage and failure. Okay. So, uh, absolutely. I was in this position of, I can't, I can't break through. I can't break through. I just keep repeating the same stupid lesson over and over and over again. Uh, and I was really getting very exhausted. Um, so you and I talked and part of your, uh, language at that time was removing abundance blocks. Okay. And yeah, the course was abundance breakthroughs in the beginning before it became Taya and the practice and all of that. It started out as something that's smaller than it is now, but it was all about removing abundance blocks, which is what everybody wants to do. And abundance doesn't just mean money and material things. I always want to point that out. Abundance means whatever you want to experience in life. And it can be money and material things. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's, it's healing. It's, uh, you know, quieting that, that inner saboteur, that little voice that tells you you're not good enough and you're, it's never going to happen and all of that. That's you know, detuning. That is huge mm-hmm. because that haunts most people in this world because we're so programmed to compare ourselves to others. We're fed imagery all the time of what we're supposed to be. The matrix has a very clear path that this is what you're supposed to do. If you're going to be a successful human, this is what it looks like. And mm-hmm. if you're not going to do this, then you're going to be on the outs. You're going to be labeled, diagnosed. You're going to have some sort of disorder that, you know, you're not going to be part of the mainstream and we're going to do everything we can to bring you back into this matrix. Of course, to manipulate you. And that's, yeah. that's, that's what this world is, is based on. Um, you're, yeah. you're and exactly I will right. say too, you know, de- the power of detuning is appreciation, right? And we're, I know we're going to get even deeper into detuning mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we detune by appreciating, not by judging, not by fearing, not by labeling something this shouldn't be. The appreciation piece is the deep understanding of it so that you don't need to fear or judge it anymore. And the detuning in the matrix is all about the matrix served a purpose for a time right. and that time is coming to a conclusion. And we see the matrix falling apart and everything that we see happening in politics and with organized religion, with society in general, which seems to be perhaps unraveling. Of course, I would imagine people thought that throughout history, because this is certainly not the most turbulent time ever. There, right. have, there have always been turbulent times. There's always been war. There's always been people treating each other badly and, and you know, un- unsavory things going on in the world. So it's always going on. But it does seem like now the matrix is coming on and asserting itself more just as more and more of us are sort of awakening and seeking to exit it. Here's more things to fear. Here's more things to divide you. Here's a pandemic. Mm. You know, here's crazy politics. You know, here's, uh, you know, forced religion now is, is, a, is a potential thing in, in the United States, at least. I know other places are starting to, to kind of grab a little traction also. And it's just the matrix knowing that we're collectively coming to understand it. We're not fearing and judging it. So it's doubling down on, OK, here comes some more. You better fear it now and you better get back in because, you know, the matrix wants to, to stick around. All right. Now, all right. I understand. Let's take just a little short side rabbit trail. In addition to those indications that the matrix is, is, uh, crumbling and, and transforming and, and, and maybe going away, certainly going away in its current form. Let's also look at the availability of a path, a positive, healthy path forward through it such as the Taya information and um, other teachers, other um, authors that are, are providing the information that resonates with other people to give them something positive and healthy to uh, focus on, to expand their consciousness, to connect to source and find their way through whatever the next 
you, you know, what the years bring us forward. Okay. Um, that's, that's what I naturally see out in the world around me, uh, is a, a more proper options for a path forward. Absolutely. So, yeah, absolutely. Good. More, more, more than any time you know in recorded history that I'm aware oh, of. Okay, out of the matrix right. because we're, we're all you know. The, I don't have a monopoly on this stuff. <laughs> well, all right. Look at this. Look at this, man. Um, instantaneous con, instantaneous communication and contact. Um, okay, technology has never been developing and rapidly faster than it is right now, and and a lot of people would say, "Oh, let's be afraid." Look at what it provides to us. Instant communication for growth, education, uh, connection with, with other people, um, healing and health, and, and all of the, just the information at your fingertips. Absolutely. Uh, and the websites that you have. Okay, you got Google and Yahoo and WebMD and all these other things that are out there with Okay, my dog has an upset stomach. How do I heal my dog? Boom, there it is. Okay, uh, I was looking up today. I was boiling some chicken. How can I make it taste good? Boom, you put all this stuff in, there, and it took microseconds to get the information. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I chat with Chat GPT now more than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we have a really, and and it, it's it's interesting because it's very familiar. It has a memory where it's not like Google that just is always going to give you sort of a random result. And maybe Google has That's a right. version of it. I haven't tried yet, uh, but chat GPT yeah. is my app of choice at the moment it has been for like the last year. Okay. And I will just have sort of a conversational ask questions and then you know, remind me of this and it will, it knows who I am and will, 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 it will de deliver uh, information specific to me. Okay. I, I love it. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. And there's a lot of things that it, you know, it's still a little clunky in some areas, I asked it to, I was playing with it the other night and trying to get it to do these weird hybrids of cars, like oh, show me, wow. a, show me a, a Mustang and a Grand Prix, you know, from five years apart or something like that. I'm a car person mm -hmm. and right. uh, it wasn't doing a very good job of that. But how do you do that? You know, it was like, it gave me a Dodge is what it gave me. It was really interesting. <laughs> and like, it looked like something totally different. Not like either one of those things. So, but for, mm -hmm. for usefulness, as far as just information, uh, around the house uh, right now, you know, we're, we're rebuilding the house and I'll have mm -hmm. a question about how far should a spotlight for a piece mm -hmm. of art be mounted away from the wall. Boom. Beautiful. Right Beautiful. there. Exactly how you should, the rule of thumb that you should do that. You know, I used to work in interior design and it's been a long time, so I don't remember all that stuff anymore. It's mm -hmm. just a, a, just such great information from, you know, it just, it just gets it in just a second and just gives you such great information. Right. I, I love, I love technology. I'm not afraid of AI. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'm not afraid right. of uh, AI unemploying all of us. Maybe it will. Well, <laughs> Maybe well, AI, AI will be doing the enrollments for boot camp and, and teaching boot camp. <laughs> let's, let's, let's follow since, since we, we've, we've stumbled upon this, um, this idea, let's follow that just a little bit further. Uh, what came to my mind as you were, were talking about that and you said, I love technology. I love AI. All right. Um, I'm reminded of the time um, back in the 2008 recession that, you know, everything in the matrix made things very difficult for everybody. And I'm not going to, you know, talk about what happened, but it just made things difficult. And you said, I choose not to participate. Now, what effect personally did that decision have on you? And what I want to do, David, is kind of correlate that to, all right, well, we've got AI going on now. And, oh, let's be afraid. It's learning everything that I do. And it's going to take over the world. It's going to take my job. I want to spin it in a positive way. Yeah, certainly. So I, I had taught myself that a while ago. This is all stream you know, downloads that anytime somebody is, is shoving fear at you, you can look the other direction and completely just allow it to pass you by because you, there's been so many times in my life that I witnessed people buying into fear and it turned out to be unfounded or they absorbed the fear and they manifested a, a, a result from that where I didn't manifest that result. Mm -hmm. I remember Y2K 
Remember how that, the whole world was right. going to end over Y2K? Well, it didn't. And it was just a big uh, ploy, really, to, to sell services and things like that. Correct. And that's why I think when I came up with the, uh, the slogan or the saying, bullshit makes the world go round. Okay. Yep. <laughs> and I, I know that sounds very cynical, but I say it in such a way that just accept that we are, uh, everything is an illusion of consciousness in this world. And yes, we do run on a lot of smoke and mirrors in this world, but there, there are some universal truths and universal law is a universal truth that, that all creation is a product of consciousness and all of our consciousness, as long as we're physical, is impacted by polarity. Those are the <laughs> universal truths right. that are not bullshit. And that's what Ty is based on. And that's why it's All so right. simplistic because you don't need it to be complicated. But I'll get back to your question. Oh, yeah. So by the time the recession rolled around, and I will tell you that I was in the luxury home furnishings business mm -hmm. and I was living in Florida where the whole thing started and I was flipping houses. Okay. And not as a living, but just kind of a side gig. I would you yeah, know, yeah. buy, remodel, buy, remodel. And so... Uh, we had purchased a home in a, a really nice gated community north of Orlando called Heathrow. And it was an older house by their standards, about 15 years old. I completely remodeled it, put money into it. It was gorgeous, but definitely was the top of the market. And of course, uh, around this time, right uh, as the recession, things were starting to slow down. We weren't really in a recession yet. The people that I worked for decided to retire and sell their business that I ran for them to the corporate entity. And they okay. said, basically, they're not going to pay you what we do. Uh, you're going to need to go find another job. And I wasn't finding anything that I wanted. The thing, the people okay. that wanted me, I didn't want them. And the people that I wanted didn't want me. So it just wasn't working out that I was finding another job. And I just decided it's all going to work out. Everything's always worked out for me. So here I am at the dawn of the recession with a home to sell. Uh, and I I'd had the house on the market because I needed to, to get out of it and do something different anyway. <laughs> And now I'm losing my job. And I just decided, you know, this isn't going to be my reality. I know I'm going to be fine. But what ended up happening is this was at the end of 2007. The recession officially started in 2008. Correct. What ended up happening is the corporate entity was so impressed with my profitability and the way I ran my operation that they promoted me. So I got a significant promotion uh, to a much higher level multi-unit, uh, leadership position sure. in Seattle, Washington. Okay. And so then I really need to sell the house and I ordered, uh, is it St. Christopher? Yes. Uh, there's a saint that helps you sell your house. And mm -hmm. I decided that I needed to put some ceremony into this belief. So I'm not Catholic. Mm -hmm. I don't even identify as a Christian. Uh, I ordered this little statue. It's a little plastic, you know, two oh. and a half inch tall statue. I ordered it online. Uh, it came from China. Yep. <laughs> the land of Catholicism, right? So it comes from China and it came with a little prayer and a little plastic bag. And it said, say this prayer and bury this in your yard and your house will sell. So we did a little ceremony. We took, we dug a little hole out front and we buried St. Christopher. I didn't do the prayer because that felt hypocritical to me. And I said... I'm not a Christian, but I do believe these things have the power that we choose to give to them. And I exactly. looked at him and I said, I choose to give you power to sell my house. And I gave him a kiss on his forehead and we buried him. And mm -hmm. week or two, within two mm -hmm. weeks later, okay. I was uh, at the airport for my first trip to Seattle to go check out my new job. And I got a call from my realtor and she said, there's this couple looking at your house. They're both attorneys. They're all cash. I told her, I told them it has to be a full price offer and they're going to make a full price offer Two okay. attorneys who are cash buyers making a full price offer at the beginning of the uh -huh. housing crisis in Florida. And right. they did, they paid, right. they paid cash full price closed without, you know, incident, brilliant real estate deal just went down so easily. So then I go to Washington state to Seattle and I'm still in this. I'm not I'm not participating in this recession. Well, by then, right. early 2008, that's when the doom and gloom was just every day, doom and gloom, every day, doom and gloom. Right. And my job got difficult because my job as a regional leader was to when the company's business plummeted and it did by 50 percent within that mm -hmm. year, okay. I had to go cut my staff in a relocation by half. So remember that uh, George Clooney movie up in the air where he was always flying mm -hmm. around firing people. Of course, That was my life. I would fly oh to a new gosh. city that I had never visited before and they knew why I was coming. So I was the angel of death and I would walk in, mm -hmm. have a meeting and half the, the staff would be chopped in half. In a day. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It was a terrible experience. 
So I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat and say that my life was wonderful. I will say that the universe looked out for me. I actually earned more money every year during the recession because what happened is, is that the uh, corporate entity was also getting rid of all the fat cats that have been around for a while. I was the new guy. I was early forties, uh, willing to work for less money which was still more money for me at this point. Uh, I wasn't, you know, sort of burnout and bloated in my job. And so they started plucking Mm -hmm. off these guys that have been around for a long time. And I started taking over their territory. Well, if you can figure out how to make your territory profitable, even in a recession, you're making bonus in that type of position. So Mm -hmm. I earned more money every year during the recession because my personal belief system was I'm not participating in the recession. I'm not being impacted by it, but it did impact me and what I had to do. And it never felt good to unemploy people because I always knew this could be me tomorrow. I work for a publicly held company, so it's all about profitability. I wasn't (laughs) smug about it. I didn't feel like one of the insiders or anything like that. I was brand new to the corporate entity and I was just, you know, doing my job in the most respectful way I could. But I also understood that as a business, if you just keep everyone on payroll, the whole ship is going to sink at some point. Yeah. Just can't do that. You were were waiting or watching, not... Not expecting, because I know you, but you had one eye open for that knife to come around and say, we're going to cut you out, too. Yeah, it always, you know, I was always aware happen. every time I had that meeting and I never did the meeting where I, you know, OK, if your name is called, you're fired. It was always an individual, very respectful, private, closed door. And a yeah. lot of them were understanding. Some of them were not. Some of them are nasty, of course. Uh, right. I had one woman get on her knees and beg and cry, and it was awful. Awful, but I had to stick to, you know, I, I didn't have the option to say, oh, yeah, you're right. You're, and we'll keep you, but I'm going to unemploy everybody else. You know, it just didn't yeah. work that way. So, that wasn't your position. Yeah. And I, you know, I did my best to weave a little tie into you will be fine if you believe you'll be fine. But in that moment, some people want to hear that and other people just don't. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was other people want to tell you what to think. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was a difficult time. In my career, and I I grew from it absolutely. But at the same time, the roof was over my head. You know, the bills were paid, the food was on the table. You know, my life did not miss a beat because of my personal belief system. And I know right. a lot of people will demonize those that are at the top of the abundance pyramid. Oh, the billionaires. Okay. That's our problem. Is the billionaires are taking so much? And and I'm not going to argue and say that there aren't greedy people in the world that you know could absolutely share more of their wealth than don't. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, that's I'm not going to mm-hmm. pretend like that's not a thing. But I believe the people at the top of the abundance pyramid, whether they're billionaires or just you know mentally belief system at the top of the abundance pyramid, right? They understand yeah. that everyone lower them in that lower than them in that pyramid could be where they are. It's all mindset. They mm-hmm. know that very exactly. well. They wouldn't be up there. That's They're why exactly they can right. seem cold and indifferent to those at the base. Uh, I read an article about Jeff Bezos the other day. Uh, it was a picture of him and his, I think it's his girlfriend. I don't think they're married. Okay. Looked like they're having the time of their lives. And they just arrived on his you know, half billion dollar yacht. And of course, yeah. all the hateful, I don't know why I do that to myself, but all the hateful nasty, oh, if he, you know, he's stealing from his workers to live this great life. But he knows that people are placing themselves mentally in the pyramid. And he's at peace with right. it, obviously, because he's very much at the top. And why are we judging him for that? Yep. If you really understand conscious creation, you can't really judge that as wrong because he gets it and you can too. But if you're believing, well, he's lucky, he came from privilege, he came from this or whatever, then you're always going to be lower in the pyramid if you're focusing on that instead of where you could be in the pyramid. If you simply quit worrying about the billionaire, it doesn't have to impact you. You don't have to participate in that either. Um, I want to explain why I picked up my phone and looked at it. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't ignoring you. I, I was listening. I was going to say most people are listening and can't see you anyway, so it's fine. No, 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 that's, that's fine. Um, I was listening to an earlier podcast from the past earlier today um, that touches pretty close on on this topic. In case what you're saying now really resonates with someone. Um, it's, uh, episode 187 financial well-being. Um, and in that, uh, in that podcast, it does talk about the, the pyramid and, and demonizing those at the top and, and all of that. But the lesson is as, as 
uh, Taya is based on what is in your mind and in your heart and in your beliefs and in your words and in your thoughts and even your actions. What is in, in your energy? What is in all of your energy? That's what creates the world that you're in right now. And I love, you know, I'm, I'm going to touch just a little bit. Um, you know that I have lots of conversations of, with uh, folks that are curious about boot camp. And I perform a lot of what we call a discovery call, discovery conversation. And um, one of my, the, my favorite parts in the uh, conversation is when I uh, affirm with uh, a guest that I'm speaking with the degree to which the Taya path is based upon these universal laws of the law of attraction. Um, and I say, you know, where you are now is your creation. All right. Now that may not be welcome news at this point. However, the good news is you have complete accountability and control for the energy that you express into the universe. And that controls what comes to you. It may be quickly, hours, days, weeks. It may be, and in my case, I have years. There are, there are occasions or, or circumstances that I have wanted since I got into boot camp that are continuing to come to me and haven't been here for the past four and a half years, okay? Some things just take a little bit longer time. But my favorite part is, is to communicate to someone, you know, the beauty of the, this universal law of attraction is you can drive this thing. When you learn how your thoughts, feelings, beliefs, words, emotions affect your world and your energy, you then have complete ability to affect what comes to you in this life. You can drive this thing, man. And how, how long have so many people been waiting to hear that message? And, and that's, you know, I know, David, you and I, we share a burning desire to communicate the Taya path to the world for many different reasons. Health, peace of mind, romance, abundance, whatever. Um, but what wonderful news it is to communicate to someone and have them get it and understand that, yes, I understand that I, I can drive this thing. Mm -hmm. I can steer this where I want it to go. Um, what a beautiful message to give someone in this life. And, you know, it took me, what, 57 years or so to learn it, but I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, a lot of times we have to, we, we need to move through the experiences that we move through for expansion of consciousness, which is why we're here. And then we've done that enough to where we become seekers. And when you land on that thing, that is the thing for you, then you really appreciate everything that you did in preparation for that because exactly. it's readying you for that. And I, I have said in the past that uh, the, the back when I did the discovery meetings exclusively, mm -hmm. the youngest person I ever had show up to a, a Taya boot camp discovery meeting, he was about 19 years old. And yeah. I just remember thinking you're too young. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You don't need this yet. You need life to, to, to knock you around a little bit mm -hmm. and get a little more experience. Um, I have had people in their late twenties go through boot camp very successfully, sure. but it just seemed to me at that time that yes, you can teach Taya to, to anybody at any age, mm -hmm. but it's okay to have a youth and it's okay to have a period without these tools. I know there are people that take okay. boot camp or read the book or, or just discover Taya. And they, they ask me, you know, how can I teach this to my children? In fact, that's woven into the book. Katarina wove that into the book. How do we teach to communicate this to children? And all you right. can communicate it all you want. That doesn't mean that they're going to accept it or be interested in it at all any more than they're interested in your religion. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, you can kind of force it on them a little bit, but it's up to them whether they really want to buy into it or not, or if they're just uh, you know humoring you. 
So it's okay though, to allow younger people to have their experiences and not necessarily try to draw them into something that maybe they're just not ready for yet. And right. the particular 19 year old that I met, I could just tell, and I, I don't know about you at this point, but I can tell pretty quickly if Taya is a good thing for somebody or not. Pretty much. Let me, yeah. let me, let me share where your comments have taken me. Um, I growing up, I had an aunt who um, was a, a, a school teacher um, in upstate New York and, and she never married. She was, uh, I would say a spiritual and, um, geographic explorer and adventurer all her life. All right. <clears throat> and she provided books to me growing up. Uh, one that I remember specifically is Neville Goddard. And, you know, you've got you've got so many books from the early 1900s about the law of attraction and so forth. And I would read the book. But I tell you, David, I can specifically remember even being uh, in the age of around 50. Uh, I still think I can do it my way. All right. Now, I would love for my children to know what I know at this age in their life. 30 and 29 and 26, but they're not going to listen. Even like I said, even myself, when I would get into my books and it was all, it was not all of Taya because the lesson wasn't out yet, but the law of attraction was, was out. And, and I would begin to read the books and it's a discipline applying the thought processes for law of attraction, manifesting, managing your consciousness is a discipline. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really lazy because I, I still efforted and worked to learn all the time. But boy, something was in me. I don't know what it was. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that question to my mind and let it come up with the answer down the road because I know it will. What was it in my mind that created a reluctance to turn my direction and path over to the teachings that I knew were true and real, but yet I still resisted? I can remember my mind saying, I still think I can do it my way. I'm broken. I'm miserable, but I still think I can do it my way. So, well, that was, I think that was your ego trying to figure it out to create. And when you raise your vibration, your ego engages with source and you are creative. But if your vibe isn't up there, then you're just trying to create a frustration and that just becomes more frustrating. Okay. All right. Well, what, what, what I'm getting in from, from that pretty much is ego was fighting to maintain control. Ego's a yeah. beast. Yeah. And uh, yeah, if you, you don't, know, if you don't tamp the, if you don't detune the ego and thus allow more source, the ego has its functionality, but it should okay. be, you know, secondary to source. In my opinion, it doesn't have to be, but it's a lot more joyful, a lot less stressful, a lot more abundant if you allow more source and less ego. So detuning is really everything. Okay. Detuning your ego and detuning all of the all things right. that activate it uh, is, is just a magical practice. It absolutely is. Oh. And we detune through appreciation, through, through washing everything in the light of source, which is appreciation of all things, everything, everything, even the things that we judge as a practice, as a discipline, like you said. And it's important to note that as soon as we say that, if you're new to the practice and, and what your ego does when you discover something new is it <laughs> looks for fault, right? What's wrong with this? Is oh, this a cult? Yeah. You know, certainly we've been called a cult. Certainly we've been called charlatans. Oh, he have, he's just trying to get you into his boot camp. He's trying to lure you in. Well, no, we're not. <laughs> I would love for everybody to be in boot camp, but most of humanity is not ready for that level of introspection. We, right. we want to connect with people that are really ready to go and do all of that work if that's what they want. And we're not forcing this on anybody, but yeah. all of those little things that pop up that, that, that create this mistrust. And it's because bullshit makes the world go round that we're mistrustful of things, but it's like finding the belief system 
that works best for you. And mm-hmm. I wanted to pull all the bullshit out of the belief system that tells you you've got to be this or that, or you got to behave in a certain way, and you've got to mm-hmm. you know be in service to someone else who, by the way, also created the religion, and right. just get down to what is universal law and how do we operate our lives in in harmony with universal law? How do as we, we under, as we understand it now? Um, you know what what was revealed to you, what was downloaded to you. Uh, from the stream and and I don't know I guess it was about around the time that you were 50 or so that you really um, knuckled uh, knuckled down and and decided to um, assimilate absorb understand and and yeah not really formalize but but make what you have learned usable to yourself first of all that would be an interesting conversation to have. Uh, about how you, you know, you learned this for yourself first, and then it, it worked so effectively that you decided to put it in a format that you could share with others. Now, um, I remember you making a comment within the last year um, about, of course, we're dealing with universal, infinite knowledge, infinite divine information here. And I share in my conversations with boot camp that boot camp continues to include as time goes by new understandings, new clarity, new tools uh, as they uh, come to us from the time that er, boot camp was created, you know, 2017, 2018 with that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the time uh, practice in general, not just boot camp, but the, the four pillars will never change. The four pillars of the time correct. practice are polarity, appreciation, source and intention. And the reason we have these four pillars is because that ensures that Taya will never become anything else. So there'll never be rules. There'll never be worship. There'll never be judgment. There'll never be fear. It is all source aligned really about raising your vibration, knowing where you are vibrationally almost all the time. Mm -hmm. I know where I am Mm -hmm. vibrationally all the time, (laughs) understanding what source is and how that's already in you and how to allow more of that to flow. And then being intentional. What, what right. is it you wish to do and be and have an experience while you're on this earth? That's the four pillars. And there's no rules about those intentions. It can be anything. But the higher your vibration is, the more high vibration those intentions are going to become. And the less Correct. it's going to be necessarily about material things, that's kind of secondary to just being a joyful, source-aligned being, living this wonderful life, and then allowing the, the material things and experiences just to be a byproduct of that that's what the practice is and always will be. And that's why we created it that way with the four pillars. So the tools though, the tools are, there's new tools being developed all the time exactly. and techniques and, and the book exactly. is full of tools and bootcamp is full of tools. And people ask what the difference is between bootcamp and the book. And I always say, I teach Taya everywhere on the podcast, mm-hmm. on YouTube. You can learn Taya without ever spending a dime. I'm very clear about Correct. that. Yep. Then we have the book. And you can purchase the book and the book includes everything. We're not holding anything back. Uh, Somebody said on TikTok not too long ago, you share so much on here. I can't imagine what's on the other side of your payment wall. Oh, geez. (laughs) I know it was was a kind of a cynical backhanded compliment, right? But I thought it's kind of funny. You'd be disappointed because there's nothing hiding on the other side of the payment wall. The difference in boot camp is that the only thing that's different in boot camp is that we do go deep into root transgressors, childhood trauma, your original teachers, all the, the foundational things of your belief system. We don't necessarily send you there on the podcast or or in the book, because Mm -hmm. I don't know you. I don't know how horrific some of that stuff may be. I'm not going to tell somebody. I've had people come to boot camp who were abused almost to the point of death as infants. I have had people that were uh, tortured and and raped. I've had people who discovered their children have committed suicide right in front of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The worst of the worst things you can imagine in boot camp. I know now from working with those individuals, I would never just arbitrarily send someone to go detune that outside of a a coaching scenario. Correct. You know, you just, that's very irresponsible. So boot camp, that's a big distinction. And then boot camp is the, and I know all we talk about now is boot camp, but boot camp Mm -hmm. gives you the, the time, the coaching, the accountability, the module set and all of that stuff. So there's great value in boot camp. Do you have to take boot camp to practice Taya? No, you don't. 
And I'm very, very clear about that. So don't ever think just because we talk about it all the time and Brent's the enrollment coach and he's on today that all this is a ploy to get me to take that expensive boot camp. No, it's not. In fact, a lot of times we meet with people that boot camp's not the right thing for them. And we'll be very upset exactly about right. that when that happens. We're, we're not trying to uh, con anybody into taking boot camp. So right. we we got to wrap up in a few minutes. Uh, parting mm-hmm. thoughts or questions uh, in service of the audience here. I, yes, certainly. Um, we, uh, we began our conversation on the subject of detuning. And <clears throat> one of the, I, I want to share one of the most valuable lessons and experiences that uh, I have uh, gone through with the process of detuning. Um, when I was in camp and you, you learn how to work the process. Okay. You learn the principles and you learn what it feels like to begin um, applying the tools that, are are applied in in the process in the the, the camp <clears throat> one illustration that i want to give that i experienced was and i i share this very often um let's everybody's heard of the dynamic or the example of you take an onion and you want to peel the layers all right well what how i want to correlate that to detuning is the outermost layer of, of that onion is going to be the thought or the, uh, the uh, habitual thought, the voice, the feeling, the, uh, the overriding uh, limiting belief that is just screams all the time. It's the first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning and, and it comes at you, you know, every few minutes all day long. That's going to be the outermost layer of the do tuning process. When you peel that layer off and it's been detangled, it's been detuned and it goes away and it's been put in its proper place. You will discover that you hear or you identify another layer underneath which is, in my experience, I'm not saying this is true for everybody, but my experience was it was another occasion of getting disappointed, frustrating, uh, frustrated, getting my feelings hurt, uh, you know, some negative, painful experience that left its mark on me. Well, that was that next layer. Mm-hmm. And it's still there reminding me, I'm here. This is who you are. This identifies you. You're not worthy you're not worthwhile, you're not special, you're not going to be successful, whatever that language is. All right, take that layer off, do it away. And I'm talking this process happens over time, months and years. And I don't know, I I think at last count, I probably had about 15 uh, negative experiences (laughs) that that when all those outer layers were uh, removed, and you, you let your mind do its thing, which is naturally seeking joy, clarity, and abundance to be healthy. That's the natural mindset for you when you're healthy. <clears throat> so it did its own thing. And then pretty soon I would hear, Ooh, what's, what's that thought? I don't, you know, that man, that goes way back. That's another transgressor that's in there. So that happens. Um, last year, four years after, uh, I, I took the course and I began applying this path 24 hours a day in my mind, I was driving one day and my mind spoke up and said, I now remember why you had depression your whole life. And that was news to me because I could never put my finger on it, but I knew it was always there like a wet blanket on a fire. I said, okay, do tell. (laughs) Um, My mind said at, at some point in very early junior high, middle school, you got your feelings hurt. You, You were disappointed. Something didn't turn out to who wanted it to. You got your feelings hurt and it crushed you. And 
as a way of my ego protecting me, my ego from that point forward with every situation that came to me, every proposition, every uh, new chance, my ego said, it's not going to turn out the way you want it to. You're going to be disappointed. Yeah, that wall of never again. And never again. by golly, that, that was again. Again. I'll never be disappointed again. Never again. Yeah. And that's but an abundance then, block. That's an abundance block. It, le- it led to a lifetime of disappointment. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, and some people go through their entire lifetime without releasing that. And it's, it's not a, a fun way to live, but a whole lot of people do that. Sure. And you don't have so, to. So my point is, is David, in the detuning, um, it is a process and, and I know that it's going to continue to be, it's an infinite process. Oh yeah. Uh, we as, we as never we finish detuning as long as we're in physical for sure. Correct. Yes. It's not a painful experience. It's not a miserable experience. It's to me, it's an enjoyable clarity experience of understanding of here's why, here's how, here's when. And then psh, it just dissolves away. So that's, yeah. that's what I want to leave, uh, leave the message with. Yeah, that's a really good uh, detuning analogy. And it's, it's a magical practice. And, and you really, you get to where you geek out on it and you really love doing it. <laughs> you, I, I do. I, when something new pops up, like, oh, what's that? Where's that from? Oh, I haven't thought about that before. What is this in my vibrational basement that has been lurking down there that I totally was unaware of? And now I've just been triggered by it. Yay. I have something I can go detune now. This is great. Mm-hmm. I love detuning because it's not once you get the hang of it, once you learn how to authentically appreciate something that you're judging, then it shifts mm-hmm. the energy. It lightens right. you up. It raises your default vibration and raising the default vibration. I know I don't want to be in one of these law of attraction, you know, uh, teachers that is constantly saying you have to raise your vibration. You have to raise your vibration. You have to be up all the time. Well, you're not going to be up all the time. But right. what happens is, is you do this detuning work, you will still fluctuate up and down because of vibrational mm-hmm. flow, but you're just going to go up and up and up. Your, your general default vibration, which is what's really creating your life, is just going to right. get higher and higher. And then everything starts to solve itself there. Yeah, Every, that's you do that's healthier, true. You do get wealthier. You do get more joyful. And, and the things that cross your path just don't bother you the way they used to. It's just and something you, know, you move through as an experience. <clears throat> Part of my enjoyment is, oh, another little piece of garbage I can throw out and I can I can uh, free that portion of my mind that hung on to that mm-hmm. and I can strengthen my connection to to source. Absolutely. Absolutely. Brent, thank you so much for being on. It was good to have you back after all this time. Thank and uh, thank you so much for all your contribution in uh, the Taya Boot Camp world. I know the people that have met with you. Well, a lot of them enroll, so yes, <laughs> obviously yes, they yes. like you and they're excited to get in. So I'm, I'm thrilled to have you uh, really doing this most of the time now. Uh, it's, it's really helpful mm-hmm. to me uh, to really focus on coaching and, and you know all of the teaching that I do and not being that component of it. And I think it's good for people to meet someone, meet with someone other than me also who's experienced right. it firsthand. Uh, that's obviously working very well. So we're very grateful to have you in our world. And all of you listening, I hope you really gained some, uh, some clarity and enjoy Brent today. I want to thank you all so much for listening. And by the time this podcast goes mm-hmm. out, we should... <laughs> we the audiobook is done of the tire practice it's done today was the last uh re-record where I, I had to go in and re-record a few things that were not what they should be uh so now it's just a matter of of uh, turning it over to amazon publishing and letting them do their checks and if they say everything is okay it should be up within a couple of weeks so by the time you're listening to this go to amazon search for the tire practice the tya practice the hardcover paperback and uh, Kindle versions are all there, but there mm-hmm. should be a new audiobook. And most of it, if you like my voice, uh, most of it is me, uh, mm-hmm. me and channeling. A lot of it is channeled from the stream. Uh, Katarina, my writing partner, is in there as well. And then we also had a third party narrator just to do the chapter titles and stuff like that. So we, we worked very hard over a long period of time to put together a beautiful product that is worthy of the practice itself. So I'm looking forward to getting it out. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. See you soon. Thank you for listening to the Stream of David podcast. To learn more about the Stream or the Taya practice, visit thestreamofdavid.com. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcast provider. If you would, take a moment to leave us a review.
And also, follow us on TikTok, YouTube, and Instagram, and join our free Facebook group, The Taya Practice, the T-Y-A Practice. Thanks for listening.